this is where we get into questions of rights and where it sparks debate amongst people today. It sparked debate among uh, Grover Cleveland's supporters and critics, as well as uh, today's in today's society, right? Okay, so um, yes, I really <clears throat> enjoy this quote and the debate that it sparks because it's always, it always does spark a lively debate. <laughs> Okay, so does everybody know, Amber just walked out, everybody know and understand that the paper topic is due on Thursday? Yes. Yep, okay, perfect. So the paper topic is due on Thursday. For those of you who weren't here, who might want to look at the, or watch the video from the lecture, perhaps. Okay. Um, I've already had some send back, and we talked a little bit about it the other day, and they, the papers should be really interesting. So I'm kind of excited to see it. Any other questions today? Any questions on chapters 19 or 20? Genteel. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's where we're going to start. This is, continuation of this is continuation of 19, the continuation of 19, yes. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> the genteel tradition and its critics, we had talked, um, oh, wait a minute. No, he went further. I'm sorry. We stopped uh, on the slide before the vaudeville. Okay, and this is kind of fun. We're going to play I'm going to play some uh, vaudeville for you. See if I can get it to go. In the meantime, we're going to play Scott Joplin. Who's Scott Joplin? So, how much money do you have? Okay. Composer, right? So what's significant about Scott Joplin? received money from, which is a completely different, uh, it's completely different than anything that had ever been done before.
What's that? They wouldn't sell his orchestra, or they wouldn't uh, listen to it because it was it was black. And I don't know where we're getting the feedback. Robin, is that you? Maybe. Oh, maybe it's this one. Okay. Let me try this one, the uh, Three Act Rats movie. See, this is your standard vaudeville <laughs> activity. It's like a, it's like a bad silent movie, right? Um, slapstick comedy, but it's all about um, short skits and funny opportunities. <laughs> Okay, we're getting way too much feedback here. I'm not sure. Wow, okay. Okay. This one is another one that you may have heard. sure where we were getting all the feedback it was doubling up but that gives you a little bit of taste of what uh, what vaudeville was and also Scott Joplin so what did you think it's kind of fun isn't it Classy. different it's very different you know okay so Premonisha was the uh, was the opera that Scott Joplin had written. And if you look and you understand um, black music and the, the Victorian genteel society, they weren't going to combine very well, were they? And so this is where you have um, the genteel society saying, no, your music doesn't qualify and uh, it's not as good as a normal opera and so we're not going to play it. We're not going to let you play it or uh, produce it. Okay? So what's he do instead? Well, he sold many, 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 many records and still does. Maple Leaf Rag, like Aiden was saying, is used in different, uh, different things today. Now, oh, I think it's 50 years that it becomes public domain. Happy birthday, you said. What's that? Happy birthday, you said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> it would be considered public domain, so he's not still benefiting from it, but there are still things that he does benefit from. Or his, he, in theory, his uh, his descendants could still. So, <clears throat> vaudeville in the 80s, from like 1880s to 1920s, you've got your comedians, the ventriloquists, okay? But it was the most popular form of entertainment, All right? And you can kind of see why. That was, um, that little clip that I showed you, I don't think I have the date of that clip. That came from the Library of Congress, that clip. And then you can find the other ones on YouTube. You can find a whole lot of people who are playing, um, yeah, Library of Congress is where the three acrobats came from. 
Uh, you can find a whole lot of Scott Joplin songs, but very few actually played by him. Those two that I played were actually him playing. Which, if you think about it, the technology that we today can still listen to something from this time frame that he actually played, I think is pretty impressive. Okay? So, <clears throat> we talked about the dance halls and amusement parks and the need for people to get out and do something different. Um, the ragtime became it just r kept rising in popularity and it was although it was considered risque a lot of young people were listening to it um, you know it was becoming almost a national craze kind of like rock and roll when rock and roll first came in okay the young people were listening to it and it was um, put down by anybody over the age of I don't know 30 uh, but parents, parents didn't want their uh, sons and daughters listening to it. Same kind of thing with ragtime. Okay? Any questions? Why was the music so big in the Like, why, why are we starting to get in this history book? That's it. You know, that's a great question. And sometimes I wonder if students are understanding. Uh, the history and why we would study the history of music, right? Why would we add that to a history class, history of the United States? Where music can reflect cultural values. Was it just another way they were seeing kind of their, um, not so much independence, it's freedoms and liberties. Freedoms and liberties. Wait till we get to the twenties and you and you see the flappers, right? And the and the music that's being played with during the the flappers, like the Charleston, like the Charleston and and some of the other twenties songs. And is it important to history to understand some of these things? It is. I mean, remember the Black Gospels and how the black gospels affected the slaves and slavery and how it affected the whites perception of the slaves and think about how uh, native dance and um, and that how important that is to that culture okay so music transcends all cultures right and so if you have music originating in the united states and spreading it worldwide, that has a, a global impact, right? And that's that's what was happening. Well, like I went to I went to a Christian I went to Christian school until I was in eighth grade, and I remember in eighth grade we wanted to have a dance, and first off we weren't allowed to listen to music at music at school, and then second off we weren't allowed to have dances because it was against the Bible. I mean there was a big uproar over the dance thing. So I, I can see how it would definitely, how it would definitely form history because when you have music, you have you're going to have the Christian populations being totally against it because they're going to say, "But what's the movie Footloose?" That's what I think of. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, music and dance can be very influential in different societies and in society as a whole. So, so yeah, we talk about architecture, we talk about music, you know, things that normally, you know, in, in history class, a lot of times, all you think about are dates and wars, right? But if you're going to understand the reason behind some of these things, that's why we include uh, a holistic view of the culture. So that's a great question. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> the genteel tradition, you've got the Gilded Age um, and coming up on the Progressive Era, but 
right now in the 1900s this victorian social and and moral the the ethos of the victorian social uh society is kind of crumbling okay because one reason is because ragtime ragtime is so popular and women are going out to coney island by themselves they're actually riding bicycles okay and a split skirt has anyone ever seen a split skirt you probably haven't seen it unless you've gone to some museum where you've seen a uh, traditional dress but um, at this time you can't show ankles like women can't show ankles okay so your skirt has to be lower than your ankle if you're going to ride a bicycle you have to have something different right and you never ever wear pants absolutely never wear pants when my mother growing up in the 30s and 40s never got to wear pants it was against the rules of the house okay you just yeah you, you just didn't wear pants yeah and as agent says now there are yoga pants right? <laughs> or stretch pants or whatever you want to call them. so a split skirt is a full-length skirt that is split and it still looks like a full-length skirt it doesn't look like it's uh separated at all because there's enough material to make it look like a skirt kind of like a skort i don't know if you've ever seen a skort or not okay so think of it as long skorts they go down past your ankles definitely have to be past your ankles right so um and in the victorian age if men saw a woman's ankle that meant that they were the women were risque. I mean, it was just, it, that's how women were seen at that time um, in the genteel societies. So <clears throat> this genteel tradition that we're talking about, you have upper class writers and magazines, and they're codifying these Victorian standards, right? But not just for culture. They're also doing uh, literature. They're talking about the arts they are um, talking about design okay one of the reasons that they're doing this is they're trying to create a national um, artistic culture all right is that a bad thing some yes some no have we seen anyone do this prior to the uh, 70s and 80s the Greeks, the French, how about in the United States? Somebody's got to get this right. Somebody who took the class last semester. Nicholas, you have a buy on this question. <laughs> Can we repeat the question? Have we seen someone or a group uh, try to create a national identity for arts or literature prior to the 1870s and 80s where you're getting this genteel tradition. Yes. Yeah. There we go. That's Ryan. Okay. So we've got the transcendentalists who are trying to create a, an American identity, okay, especially in literature where you have Hawthorne, you have Poe, you have uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, all right? You're gonna see this now, you've seen this again, where they're trying to, to create this coherent national artistic culture. Okay, so you've got um, Mark Twain, and what is Mark Twain doing? He doesn't like what? He doesn't. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, he's not the only one, is he? No, he's definitely not. He's exploring new forms of fiction. Okay. To broaden the appeal to the general public. Okay. Because. 
if you think about it, a lot of literature, especially if you're looking at literature that focuses on, um, you know, the classics or something, that's not American, that's not a national cultural identity. Okay, And then you have magazines coming out like the Ladies Home Journal and Cosmopolitan. They also include some fiction in their magazines. They also include um, ads. Okay, so ads are paying for these these things. And so you have people writing about naturalism. Okay, where denying free will. Okay, life's outcomes are determined by economic and sociological forces. All right, and realists who are taking everyday things during this time and writing about them. And that's not common, right? That's kind of a new, um, a new way of thinking, all right? Uh, Harry David Thoreau wrote about common things. He wrote about his beans, right? I mean, he talked about his green beans and how the chipmunks were eating his green beans, right? Okay, but so you you see this as as continuing and and actually growing. So this went back to the beginning of blogs. Beginning of blogs, not quite, but but yeah, I, you can see it. You can see where you're becoming more realistic, and then you get to uh, today's society where it's not just realistic. It's well, I ate, uh, I ate eggs this morning. And I'm sitting watching the Today Show, drinking coffee, right? I mean, that's what you see today on Facebook or on social media, right? Oh, yes. All right. So you've gone from realism to uh, a public knowledge of every moment of your day in some cases. Okay? So to... Uh, <clears throat> Twain, who was really seeking this mass market audience, was writing toward and for this mass market. Okay? Theodore Dreiser, who was also a, a writer, wrote Sister Carrie in 1900. Okay? So they're breaking from the manners, they're breaking from decorum, they're, break, they're using slang, or they're using very uh, controversial situations. Right, where a woman actually um, falls in love with someone else uh, that she's not married to. So these are breaking traditions. And, you know, if you look throughout history, writers um, are constantly breaking tradition. Some writers are constantly breaking tradition. They're pushing, pushing boundaries. In today's society, you see it a lot in the movies. Okay? Push the boundary of manners and decorum. And video games, yeah, that's a great example as well. Okay? So, <clears throat> you have not just Mark Twain, but now you have some scholars also challenging the Victorian mores. Okay? Which are, does everybody know what a more is? Okay. It's a sociological term where it talks about the moral customs and the attitudes of a culture. Okay, so um, there are different mores. Like every society has their own mores. Okay, freedom is an American more. Okay, make sense? All right, so <clears throat> sociology came about. And so these you have these new scientists, this new discipline. And by 1900, it's becoming harder and harder to accept this this Victorian outlook, this Victorian, uh, these Victorian ideals, okay? One of the ways that, another way that they are um, pushing back against the Victorian age is instead of the architecture of the Victorian age where you have the row houses, uh, like three-story row houses in the middle of the city, um, Frank Lloyd Wright comes in and it's, it's all modernism, okay? The building, the form should follow its function, OK? 
Okay. Now Frank Lloyd Wright takes it um, almost to an extreme. Okay. If you're going to build a a home on a stream, the stream runs right through the home. Okay. Literally, it just it runs right through the home. Okay. And trees come up through the home. So. <clears throat> As they're looking for this national um, design, they're talking about this American design standards, these American design standards. But you also have painters, okay? And uh, I'm sorry, Prairie School. Prairie School would be architecture, and Frank Lloyd Wright would be one of those architects, okay? So modernistic, looking to the future. You have paintings by Mary Cassatt, everyday life. She has a famous one that that you'll see here of a woman bathing her daughter, okay? And so, um, one, of the, one of the things that they're focusing on, or that they're uh, illuminating by focusing on the everyday life is that <clears throat> you have this gap between the urban and the rural and the rich and the poor, okay? Um, as you see, and and I don't have a lot of examples in here, but your book has some, some good examples as well. So you have the photographs of the little kids on sitting on top of the um, garbage bins, okay, in the middle of the city. Do you have that photo in your, in your book? Okay. And <clears throat> it's, it's depicting these, these gaps and, and showing it in a way that um, hasn't previously previously been done okay also one of the gaps is immigrant versus native born okay so here you have Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie school style home in Oak Park Illinois all right you notice it's very flat and it's sprawling and it's not even really sprawling it's it's not like your McMansions today but it's not your three-story row home um, all built the same way okay it's for this time it's very very different and then here you have uh, falling water which this is the geology of the stream right upstream from falling water okay and you see I don't know if you can see it very well um, at outreach but the strata the geology there is it's very um, stratified okay all the rocks so it's all layered rock okay and it's very hard rock you can see because it's very smooth where the stream has run it's very very smooth okay and here is falling water and there's the stream that you saw previously you can see on the right there's a like a fountain and a little, I don't know, a pool, a little pool. But you can see the stairs coming down into the stream. Okay? And the stairs go up into the living room of the home. So you can walk out over the top of the stream. It's built over the top of the stream. Um, it's, it's pretty... It's, it's pretty amazing. They have it blocked off right now. You can't walk down the stairs any longer. Um, but <clears throat> it's, it's a way for you to, to see that. And then look, he form versus function, right? So as form, he's copying the local geology because it's very, he's using all layered rock, okay? And it's all very flat. Okay, here's the example of also using form versus function where you have the, um, this, you can see people walking here along the road. This is the driveway that goes past it. To the left is the, um, is, there's a tree. If, I don't know if you can differentiate the tree, but next to the wall, there's a tree growing up through the supports that go out and those go across and are embedded into the bedrock next to it okay so the tree is growing through the house um, it's technically not inside the house but there are other ones that are inside the house 
All right, here's a picture. And again, I didn't pay the, what was it, 20 or 30 extra dollars to go in the house. Yeah, it was already, I think, $20 just to go walk along the grounds. So, um, I, we, you needed a ticket. Anyway, so I'm standing there and I'm taking pictures from the outside in. But you can see uh, how he's integrated the supports and how he's integrated it. And all that furniture that you see, you can see the table, the long table, was built specifically for this home. Um, just like most architects do in in uh, custom homes. They make sure that the the furniture that you include is complementary to their design. And I'm probably not using the correct words, but that's those are my words. All right. You can see this long bench leading out onto uh, the patio, one of the patios that goes out over the top of the um, of the creek. Now, in my mind, you'd have a lot of mold in this house because you're like built on the creek. But it's seemingly because of the windows and the in the ventilation, they didn't really have that problem, seemingly. And this is. If you see a photo of falling water, this is probably the photo that you see because you can see where it comes down and uh, there's a waterfall right under the house. Um, and you can see the stairs where the stairs have gone down. So you're seeing it directly from the other side of this. It's really, it's, it's uh, an amazing place to see if you ever get to, to go. It's in western Pennsylvania on a road going I don't remember the the name of the road anyway it's a it's a smallish it's it's like an Alaskan road it's a pretty small road um, going from the southern freeway to the northern freeway any questions so was that that was designed in this era or? it was he lived until I want to say the 60s so it wasn't designed in the 1800s, but it's Frank Lloyd Wright and it's using the same prairie style. Okay, so it's an example of the prairie style. Okay. And here's a picture of Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt left the U.S. and went to study or paint with uh, Monet and Degas, the Impressionists, over in France um, after a while. But she's still known, she's one of the more famous um, American artists, especially of this time, and, and one of the more famous uh, women American artists. Okay, so from Victorian lady to the new woman, um, you know, as women are trying to um, change the Victorian thoughts, or re revolt, uh, as your book says, revolt against the Victorian refinement. Okay, uh, the role of women s is changing again. Okay, and it really wasn't an open rebellion. These women weren't taking to the streets and protesting, but they were behind the scenes doing different things, and they were able to, you know, as uh, Frank uh, Frederick Douglass said you women have a lot of influence to begin with. Why do you need the vote now? Okay, So women were using that influence behind the scenes to revolt against this Victorian age and the Victorian uh, genteel ideas. So they were widening their sphere as they had separate spheres, Okay, and they were now becoming more involved in politics. They had started becoming involved in politics with abolition, yes? Yes, absolutely. So now they're, they're doing more political action. They are, uh, women were some of the, uh, some of the main proponents behind temperance. What's temperance?
Nobody knows? Alcohol. Okay. Against alcohol. Temperance. Prohibition. Women were one of the reasons the prohibition actually passed. Okay. What's that? <laughs> okay. So Aiden said that was a shame. So the Women's uh, Christian Temperance Union. They were talking about temperance, but they were also adding in prison reform. They were adding in labor arbitration, public health, welfare work. Okay, This is something that you've seen women doing up to this time, but now they're becoming more and more active politically. Okay, Because you're starting to see them also doing things uh, that are a little more public. Okay. And this is when the, the younger women really started getting into riding bicycles. Uh, bicycles became this craze. One reason is because they actually made them where women could ride them, you know, with smaller wheels, two of the same size wheels instead of the huge round uh, wheel in the front and the little tiny one in the back. So they were safer as well. But marriage was also shifting. Divorce rate by 1900 was 1 in 12. In 1880, it was 1 in 21. But women were given, they were granted more divorces. Okay, And so attitudes, as they're shifting, where they have more um, political pull and more say, they had great influence on uh, this, this thought pattern had the greatest influence on the middle class, uh, college educated women, okay? And those are the ones who had the time to, uh, well, they had leisure time, right? The working class women had no leisure time, correct? Right, okay. So you had middle class women who actually uh, could have time to go do social work or do some nursing or, um, you know, for a working class woman, like a shop girl, somebody, if you were lucky, you worked in a department store, okay, instead of a factory, or you worked in an office instead of a factory, okay, but it's a, it's a far stretch to go from there, from the, from a shop girl status to a woman of leisure, okay, is that still, you still see where society is, still see that huge gap there? Okay, um, women, although they're um, they're being touted as these new women, their home is still their main uh, responsibility is what is being seen as. And then public education as an arena of class conflict. Why is that? Give me an example of class conflict in public education. Okay. People from lower classes going to school with higher class people. What's that mean in class conflict? Values. Different values, perhaps. Okay. Different jobs in the end. Ah, and what should be taught to them? Very good. Yes. You have a lot of different issues. You have this this migration of immigrants, this immigration of immigrants, right? And you have native-born, middle class, you have the Irish, um, and you have Catholics, you have Protestants, okay? So you see religious conflicts because uh, King James Version versus the Catholic Version of the Bibles, right? You have um, public monies, you know, where are you, are you going to pull the public monies from the schools? At this time, schools could still receive different public monies. So you have the upper class, as Garrick was talking about, you have the upper class pulling their kids to go to private schools, okay? Which are now um, more inclusive 
but you still have a lot, especially in the East Coast. Holy moly, you have a preponderance of, uh, of, I would say, if I'm going to stereotype, quite wealthy private schools, okay, of different religions. And so you would have people pulling their kids because of religious ideals to start their own schools. Um, you have people pulling their kids so they're not influenced by all the Im immigrants uh, because your child may be going somewhere different than the immigrant child. They may be going in two totally different career paths, right? And so <clears throat> the children, it was becoming more and more evident that if you could influence the children, you may be able to influence the society that the immigrants are bringing in, right? This is the theory. And this is, a, this is an upper and middle class theory of if we have these children in school and mandate that they come to school between the ages of um, 8 and 14, then we can teach them X, Y, and Z, and they will become this type of American citizen. Okay? Now, critics of that would say the... Um, they're trying to bring public education and they're trying to educate the masses, which is what New England has tried to do since they first came on the Mayflower. Yes? Okay. So um, you can see where all of these different ideas and ideals and mores are coming together and create that class conflict. Okay? Because there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of... Um, tension, okay, between the two. And so this is where you see uh, public education as that. So um, you have female seminaries, you have, you're sending your sons to private academies, like if you talk um, Phillips Academy in Andover, uh, Phillips Exeter, Milton Academy, uh, St. Paul's, okay, some of these are still some of the top academies in the country today and they were being built some of them were built in the in the 1700s but a lot of them were also built in the 1800s okay so uh, school boards and the influence on the school boards this is also when you see tenure coming in so that um, actually it's it's coming in it's coming in because of the influence from the political bosses that you're going to see here in chapter 20. But you see where there are many different reasons for the increase of public education standards and public ed education like curriculum. All right, does that make sense? Okay. So, any questions? No, they say. Okay, we're here in chapter 20. Okay. Um, does anybody know who this is in the picture? Isn't that the last queen of Hawaii? Yes. Very good. Very good. Both Nicholas and Garrett got it. Queen Liliuokalani. And I'm pretty close in the pronunciation. <laughs> pretty close. Not not quite exact, but pretty close. So. Um, we're going to talk about expansion in the industrial age. All right, so contested political visions. Okay, so you have Garfield, and in the beginning of class we talked about him. He is 
uh, a Democrat, but he's also known for scandal and corruption. Okay, so you have you have a lot of people in this age that are coming up with scandals and corruption, and um, he was president in 1880 because the nomination came from a split a split in the Republican political party. So again, what do you see when a party splits? Generally, they lose. Not every single time, but almost. All right? So um, Garfield was assassinated, was he not? Okay. Why was he assassinated? Well, somebody didn't like him, but it was because of this scandal. He, they were expecting him to give them a job, a high-paying, high-influential job when he became president because it's the um, the time of scandal. Yes? <laughs> I don't know if he liked lasagna. He could have. <laughs> So, um, his assassination just depicted the absurdity um, of the late 19th century politics, okay? Because you have, it's just full of rife, it's full of damaged reputations, and the political battles are very, very close. Very, 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 very close for many years, okay? So you see this flipping and the flopping of uh, political parties and that. So <clears throat> there was intense economic and social debate. 1877. Where are we economically still in 1877? Depression. Depression. Exactly. Does that lead to economic debate? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> as we're looking at this industrial growth and how this in, how industries are growing and how they should be regulated, you know, there are very different views on how or if they should be regulated. Okay? And who should benefit financially? Now, if you were in power, if you were critical of the person in power, you would say that the only reason that person was in power is because they wanted the financial benefit of being in power. Right? Many of them ended up financially benefiting because they were in political power. <laughs> so some of the critics and, and some of the reasoning behind the, uh, these critics was definitely validated. Right? So <clears throat> the struggle to com control the economic expansion peaked in the 1890s okay and then you have populists who are a third party that joins into the political arena okay and then uh, between this 1870 and 1890 this power keeps going back and forth all right between 1870 and 1894 how many presidents do you think there were Four. Yeah. It's a lot. Four presidents between those years. Okay? So, in 1896, you have William McKinley brought in. Okay? And he actually, with William McKinley came a time of uh, Republican influence. All right? But up till that point, it just kept flopping back and forth. The House... Control of the House changed five times within that same time period of four presidents. Yes? So this is telling that we are, now at any point in history, Democrats and Republicans kind of like switch their values. And like, so right now the Republicans are where the Democrats have been last to like vote. Kind of thing. What? It's I been changing. It's been changing. So Grover Cleveland, who says women, are um, should not 
be allowed to vote, basically, is a Democrat. Right now they have a Democrat running for president. Okay? So you see where it's, it is changing. So, but it's not just an in, instantaneous change. Okay, you saw it start changing. With the definition of Republicans, the definition of Republicans has only been around since um, like 1860. Okay? So you'll see that. And then wait till we get a little bit further in. Yeah. Check again, uh, like in the 20s and that. Um, but yes, it's definitely different than it is today. And uh, Democrats also during, up to this point and through the Civil War, think of what Democrats were standing for in the South. Were they, what were they standing for in the South during the Civil War? Slavery. Slavery. Exactly. Okay. And then when they needed when they couldn't win the blacks over um, to vote for their party, what did they do? Use force. Used force. Exactly. So they brought the blacks over to the Democratic Party because the only way you were going to survive without being lynched or, um, you know, have, well, be, before you were lynched or uh, not able to even survive, really, they would use force to bring them over to the Democratic Party so the Democratic Party could rise again. Right? Okay, and that, that, that's not really a flipping of the, the Republican Party, but that's a dramatic uh, difference than today, where they were so pro-slavery um, than today, right? All right, so during the same time, you have seven new western states, okay? So your party competition was intense. You can see it had to be intense for them to change presidents four times. You also see 85 or 90 percent voting in some of these elections, okay? Some of them, even up to 95 percent of the people registered to vote actually voted. How unusual do you think that is today? Yeah. School board, which is not, of course, a, uh, a presidential election school board, you get 10% or less voting for school board in, in some cases. Okay? Versus 95%. So... <clears throat> Um, in 2012, 57.5% of the population who registered to vote actually voted in a presidential election. All right. So the 1800s, the late 1800s, you have incredible voting power. Thus, it's driving what? It's driving the political machines, right? And political visions. You have that much intensity. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna. You're going to go far. All right. So it talked about your Interstate Commerce Act, okay, and the Sherman Antitrust Act, and um, how social efforts in government, but not necessarily economic efforts in government. So up to this point, government isn't trying to mandate a lot of the industrial, um, industrial age. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's uh, exactly, thank you. It's up for debate. Okay. So they were hands off in many ways. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Act tried to regulate, in, institute some regulations. The ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, tried to institute some, um, some regulations. But they also, um, got shot down by the Supreme Court, and then they were supported by the Supreme Court. So you see where uh, where things are caught like in flux, all right? 
And so <clears throat> neither the Democrats nor the Republicans believed that the national government had any right to regulate the corporations or protect the social welfare of the workers, right? So this is where that flux is coming because neither one of them were going to do anything. Now, laissez-faire. Explain to me laissez-faire. Hands off. Yes. And so, hands off of what? Hands off of not quite everything. Business. Yes, business. Okay. Economics. Um, so, <clears throat> they should promote economic development, but they shouldn't regulate it. So, by promoting it, they could give away these land grants. They could do these things for the um, businesses, but don't regulate them. Okay? So, people, the citizens, knowing that the government, federal government was going to do this, was not going to do that, they went to the state and the local governments. And then the state and local governments had, um, were vying for the power amongst themselves, the power to regulate. Okay, did you regulate? Can you regulate? Can you regulate um, things like railroad pricing? You know, that went to the Supreme Court. Okay, and also at this time, both parties were known for fraud in their elections. All right, party strength. Party strength came in... Um, these regional and ideological parties, all right? And we've seen this because the Republicans now are, again, uh, they're not a wholly national party because the Democrats have taken over the South again. Uh, the Democrats are the majority in the South. They have Democrats in, in other regions. You have Republicans the majority in the North, um, although you still have some in the South, and then the West is, is a mixture, right? But what they could do, especially the Democrats, would focus on um, immigration and immigrants coming in. Republicans were focusing a lot on native porn, right? Uh, they were focusing on rural and small town, okay? Patriotism and veterans benefits, while the Democrats were defending immigrants and opposing prohibition, okay, supporting parochial schools, okay, because those were important to the immigrants of the time. And so state and party, local party leaders were managing campaigns. So they would pick you, okay, these party bosses would pick who was going to run, and then they would tell all the people coming to them to vote for X, and that's how they would win. Right? So the local political um, bosses in these cities, especially in, I, the, if we can pick on New York City, <laughs> New York City Tammany Hall was known for the corruption. And they were known for uh, just these, this, this political boss who was so powerful that he was, he was running the city. Okay? Um, and so, you have this boss in the, in the machine, okay? So, so the boss is the the politician, and he might have been he he became he might have started as a a tavern owner, who knows? But you become part of the local uh, political machine, which is this growth of unofficial party organization, okay? That its main job was to keep X in office, okay? If, if you were the Democratic machine in, uh, in a city, you were going to keep the Democrats in office, no matter what, all right? And so uh, they, the, the party, and this is one of the reasons that some of these cities grew so dramatically during this time, because you have the... Um, the immigrants coming in, you have the party buses and say, okay, we want to do X, Y, and Z. You have all the voters, all of your voters voting for that, and you get in.
but you also put uh, this person in charge and that person in charge and that person in charge they all owe you and so you go to that person and say you need to grant us the contract to build the sanitation in uh, this district and so you get it right so you just keep putting your workers and your people in place uh, to run all of the departments in the city okay does that make sense party machines were and and still can be um, enormous all right Tammany City Tammany the Tammany Society which was um, Tammany Hall uh, you had with the payoffs and the ward bosses um, you had urban social services being divvied up so the war the bosses would also try to help the widows if you were a part of their party and your your husband was killed but he was part of that party he'd give the widow a little bit um, but the critics the the native born or the party that wasn't in charge were very critical of that because it was so corrupt okay and the urban elite wanted to clean it up they wanted to restore good government okay part of the Victorian moral is um, more ethical right any questions about party bosses and machines Okay, you have issues with money. You've had issues with money for a long time, haven't you? You have the Greenback Party. Greenback par Party supported what? Any ideas? Paper money. Very good. Okay, as opposed to gold and silver as specie. So it's not necessarily backed by gold and silver anymore, is it? Okay, during the Civil War, they printed money that wasn't backed by gold or silver. Okay. A lot of people didn't trust the greenbacks because it wasn't guaranteed. And so people um, were very suspicious of this. And they have been since, oh, I don't know, George Washington's time. Okay? So this isn't anything new about the money. So <clears throat> bankers and creditors were thinking that Economic stability equals a strictly limited currency supply. Okay? Today, in today's society, we have uh, an overabundance of currency supply. Yes? Anybody been keeping up on it? Current events? Okay. We have a lot of currency. Right now, it's keeping the inflation low. Okay? Um, they also worry about deflation when you print too much money. So, uh, <clears throat> economics isn't my isn't my uh, first love, but it's it's something that everyone should have a working knowledge of, okay? Because the money supply and how it is supported by a nation, no matter what nation, is important to you. And your position, your benefits, your retirement, your paychecks as you go through life. Okay? So the Greenback Party uh, really came about in 1877. And what was going on in 1877? Depression. depression. Right. Still in a depression. Starting to come out very soon, right? They wanted to expand the money supply so that it was a little easier to live. Okay? Because if you had more money, then, boy, maybe you could buy something. Like food. Alright? Um, <clears throat> so, as you're increasing this money supply, it would benefit the workers and farmers. So, generally, the debtors wanted to expand the money supply. So the farmers were in debt and wanted to expand the supply so that they could buy some food. They could buy some seed, right? All right. As prosperity 
ga um, came back, the Greenback Party lost its main focus because it was no longer needed. Right? So you get the uh, U.S. You get um, Congress in 1873 who told the U.S. Mint to cease making silver coins. But then you have the Sir Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890. One of the reasons is because you have an abundance of, of silver in Nevada, right? The people who are living in Nevada and the owners of the mines in Nevada wanted someone to buy their silver. So they advocated in Congress to pass this act, all right? So Congress passed this act in 1890 that they would buy 4.5 million ounces of silver monthly and issue treasury notes, but the Treasury Department printed them and then didn't circulate them. So it didn't, it didn't uh, do what the people who had passed the act wanted it to do. They wanted more money in circulation. Okay? So they increased the monetary supply slightly, but they issued fewer treasury notes. So, um, does that make sense? Okay, everybody understand that? All right, civil service reform came about because of the spoil system and pork projects. You hear about pork projects today, don't you? Absolutely, you hear about pork projects. When Senator Stevens was in power, people were complaining about uh, Senator Stevens in the pork, not the Alaskans, but many of the of his critics from other states were complaining about him because he brought so much pork into the state of Alaska. Okay, just uh, various projects that he funded within the state of Alaska. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop there. We're going to we're going to start again with the spoil system on Thursday. Nicholas, do you have any questions about your current event that's on Thursday? No, I don't. Okay, good. So it's a full page on each event, and you have to send the information of, that you're using, okay? All right. All right. So I'm looking forward to it, and I will see you all on Thursday. Yes, Savannah? Okay, uh, we'll have to switch yours. I don't have the schedule in front of me, but we'll switch yours on Tuesday. Okay. Okay. All right, so maybe you can switch with Aiden or Derek or Amber. So you can work it out with them. Okay, any other questions? All right. Well, I will see you on Thursday.